Welcome back to Keeping It Real. I'm Jim Vavita. This is Terry Schwartz, and we are out. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Jim actually isn't here this week. You might notice his absence, but wait, we have him here with us in spirit. Jim, as we love, he uh, he made such an impression on the Justice League set visit that Batman called him up and was like, "Yo, dog, you want to join the Justice League?" So you heard it here first. It's going to be Batman, Aquaman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Jim Vavita and Super a Flash. Stacks. Super stacks. Uh, he's driving. In, in all seriousness, pretty much our entire entertainment team is either in New York, which is where uh, Joshua, Scott, Clora, and Eric are, and Jim is in Florence right now, uh, enjoying the the perks of the gig at the Inferno Junket. So Ahmad and I here are holding down the fort, and we have not delivered a keeping it real in so long that we're just we're gonna have some fun. There's new news. New, new movies, new trailers, new titles, new rumors, new everything. So we're gonna get into it. We're gonna we're gonna have some fun. And the inmates have officially taken over the asylum. Yeah. Well, you're the boss. You're sort of. It's like the Warren, and then the one inmate left. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so, so some big news this week. We've talked a lot about video game movies in the in the past. Uh, Assassin's Creed. We're still waiting, sort of a proof of concept to see if that movie will be good. But apparently, maybe people are hearing good things internally because a gear of War movie is officially happening. We know it's at Universal and nothing else. Like, yeah. no plot, no director, no writer, no planned release date, no where it's going to take place in the Gears of War chronology. Uh, Ahmad, do you think, does a Gears of War movie, on the surface, just knowing that it's in production, make sense for you as something that will translate to the big screen? Um. I, this that's a hard one. I mean, I mean, because Halo was close a couple of times, and this is actually Gears' second time up at the plate. Last time they actually had a, a director and a writer lined up. Um, I, gritty space war movie? Sure, anything is right. possible. I mean, it worked for Aliens. So. And I think, yeah, I think it's definitely, it's probably taking the gore a step farther, and obviously there are a lot of fun weapons, that's fun of the game. We actually, uh, it's it's funny timing, I'm sure Gears being in the air is part of why the news came out about the movie, but uh, Gears of War 4 is is coming out soon, shortly. Very we have our soon. review in progress up on the site, and Ryan McCaffrey gave it a 9.2, which it's, is a pretty high score. There's going to be another 9, another 9.2 score later in this, uh, in this podcast, so you definitely, you don't want to run away to look at the site and figure it out before these next yeah, minutes they can, are over. <laughs> if they can Starship, you know, if you look at Starship Troopers, there's there's definitely a lane for that, that type of gory sci-fi action war movie. So I think Gears is one of those franchises that is big enough that even if you don't play video games, you've heard about it, right? And again, like the basic premise of, of alien space war, Blood, gore, fighting—like, yeah, yeah, it's 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 the things that you can get people into a movie theater with. It's just a matter of translating that to a, an engaging movie, which is a big problem that video game adaptations have had so far, and also deciding whether you're just gonna take that premise and make your own thing, which didn't really work for Halo. Obviously, that didn't come out, but they were sort of trying to figure out how that fit, or, or trying fit it into the pre-existing lore. Also challenging because you're having a lot of assumed knowledge there. And, and I believe what they've already said is obviously this isn't going to be 100% based on on the source material. So they're going to have to take some liberties. I think the biggest problem with all give video game movies is the most the, the part that draws people to video games. One of the biggest part is how interactive it is. And I mean, you're playing as a character within that environment. And once you take that out, you're telling a story in a non-interactive way, and it's one way you're like, hey, I want you to see this this part of the story where it's like, no, I want to control the story as much as humanly possible. So I think that's always a barrier for video game movies. So we'll see what they can do. If they can just make it a really engaging, big, I mean, this is going to be like a big temple movie. You know, we'll see. I know. I've said it time and again, but I do feel like if Assassin's Creed comes out and is the huge hit and everyone loves it, I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of Deus Ex, Splinter Cell, uh, <laughs> Division, oh, Gears. Everything that was like, greenlit like five yeah. years ago is back on the all table. Those, all those announcements are going to be coming through uh, very quickly. If <laughs> Assassin's Creed bombs, I have a feeling a lot of these movies are going to quietly dissolve because that does seem like the last hurrah right now to see if we can actually make this work. Uh, now, shifting over to some new titles for movies that we have been very excited about. A really cool debut of the untitled Wolverine sequel. We now find out it's called Logan. Uh, and the poster, I'm very, I'm curious what your thoughts are on it. It's basically a uh, Wolverine three-clawed hand holding the hand of a young child. And it's clear, like, it's, you know, a bit scarred. He's, he seems to be an older person, but also 
Logan is his his human name, not his superhuman no, name. No. So what do you think about that title? Uh, I, I think the, the direction, even if it if it's not what it turns out to be, but I think the inference is Old Man Logan. We've already seen some photos of Hubert Jackman with where they got out. People are like, why does Hugh Jackman look old? I'm like he's probably doing Old, old Man Logan. Wolverine yeah, I think 3. it's pretty pretty assumed that that's what it is at this Which point. Which is it's it's a nice way to kind of convey that because the general audience that doesn't read comic books is like, oh, hey, Wolverine and a baby. Okay, cool, whatever. <laughs> and people read comics are like, oh, like I mean, they're like losing their stuff. So I, 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 that's most likely they will go with a version of that. We just saw the Patrick Stewart picture today, and Patrick Stewart looks it's aged. Old man Professor X to get yeah. old man Logan. Which is something they would need to do, because in the story it's, it's, it's Logan and Hawkeye going on this road trip, and, well, we can't use Hawkeye, can we? So, you know, put, put Professor X in the, in the car. Let's see where we go. And what we've heard is, you know, basically it's, it's senile old man Professor X seems to be what oh. they're saying is that he's like on the brink, not really sure of, of who he is and he needs uh, Logan there to guide him. It is really interesting, though, because they're finally, you know, for all, whether you loved or, or hated the entire X-Men franchise or were on the fence about some of them, this is a movie or, or a series that's earned the right to do a this is how far our character has come story. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy to think back that, you know, when, over 15 years ago is when yeah. we were still getting into the superhero craze. And now to, it, this seems like it's really going to be a good capstone for uh, for Hugh Jackman's character. What what do you want to see happen in this movie? Not even as a comics fan, but as a fan of this series. It'd be nice for Jackman to get a nice send-off. I am sure that he is probably tired of working out for six months a year and not drinking and eating all kind of crazy carbs and... You know, I think he'd probably be like, hey, can I just take a couple years off and <laughs> hang out with my family? Um, it would be a nice send-off because I can't think of, just off the top of my head, anybody who, in recent memory, who has played a character that long over that many films it, recently. As opposed to, like, the Bonds where it was Connery for a long time. But, I mean, he's been playing Wolverine for a, like you said, 15 years. And he still nuts. remains, like, the most iconic character in that film franchise. Yeah, if the, the, the X-Men movie performances seem to do well or do better based on how much Logan there is on the poster. A lot of, lot of Jackman on the poster, decent box office. Right. Not a lot of Jackman on the poster, okay box <laughs> office. And it's not a stamp of quality. I mean, First Class was great, but there was no Logan on the poster. And the box office was not the highest out of those films, so... Um, you know, getting getting a little more, getting, getting Jackman a nice send off so he doesn't have to do crunches for sixty days in a row. No, Good I for can't. him. Yeah, he, he deserves it at this yeah. point. He's brought enough money into that franchise. Eat some pasta. Uh, in in other new title news, a movie that I keep trying to willfully forget. <laughs> is coming, but it is coming. Uh, the Blade Runner sequel is now titled Blade Runner 2049. If you forgot, which I did, the original Blade Runner movie is set in 2019, which is only a few years from now. Uh, so this is 30 years later confirming that this movie obviously brings back Harrison Ford, uh, but also has Ryan Gosling starring in it, Robin Wright, uh, a really great cast, but man, I mean. And a good director. A, a good director, but. Uh, Blade Runner is one of those films now that is taught in film schools as like these are all the the notes you need to hit. This is this is a great example of sci-fi sort of at its best. The performances are great. The questions it raises are great. That to me, obviously we've we've come and returned to a lot of franchises over the years, but this one just I'm still like I don't know. <laughs> look, Blade Runner is my all-time favorite movie. I did not uh, know that. Yeah, I actually. Unrelated, I actually got married probably about 1,500 feet from where Bryant's office was at, at Union Station, downtown LA. Um, I love the movie. I th I, I like the book. Um, the script is, I mean, Hampton Francher, David Webb Peoples. David Webb Peoples also wrote um, uh, Unforgiven, which is also one of my top five favorite films. Um, it's such a strong story, and you have all these different themes, and it's and they've, they've tried making sequels in the book form, which... Uh, save your money. Uh, yeah. It's it's just one of those movies. A, it's been a really long time, and I think re making sequels, not even re not even a reboot, but making sequels to movies 10, 15, 20, 30 years later after they come out, never seems like a good idea to me. Um, you either start fresh or do something else. But and I think I'm one worried, of, I, one even of though my, it's a quality cast. Yeah, I think I think the movie itself, like the effort being put in, is fine. But I'm more just bristle and feel uncomfortable with the idea of this movie in particular having its story continue because there is something to be said for a, a story 
ending and just being left where it is. To me, one of the things that it remains so compelling about Blade Runner are those sort of like echoing unanswered questions that you're left to think about yourself. One of them is like, is Deckard an android or not, right? Like, which is which is which the funny Ridley thing Scott is, has said. Well, that's the funny thing is, is that that's one movie where the director and the actor were not on the same page. Right. The director, the actor, and the person that wrote the book all have competing visions of Rick Deckard. Harrison Ford was like, "Hey, he was a human to me, and I played him as, a, as if he was a human." And Ridley's like, "No, he's a replicant," and that's why I made the other part of the reason why I made the director's cut in my version, where you, we put the extra reflection in the eyes, right. so you could see all of that, and. They were not on the same page. They were not on the, I mean, there was a really, uh, there's a book called Future Noir. If you're into Blade Runner, read the book. It tells you all about the production. That was a lot of headbutting. Um, there was a strike. It was, it was, it's a very rocky production. Ridley Scott is a director, too, who likes to go back to his original films and retinker and release different cuts. Whenever I watch Blade Runner, I just watch the original one. That was the first one With I the saw. Voiceover? Uh, no, no, no. The, oh, the director's cut. The, the director's cut, yes. I, I'm sorry. The, the one that, oh, the God. widely popular Blu-ray yeah. that, that you, or DVD that you can find most places. I, I apologize. Luckily, I the, luckily, the voiceover one is harder and harder I actually, to find. I have seen the voiceover one, though, and it's really It's, it's jarring bizarre. to watch now. Yeah, like, but that's sort of the heavy-handed sort of storytelling that they were concerned they needed. But again, like the, the director's cut, thank you for correcting me, is has this sort of aura around it that you're supposed to question things and wonder and this sequel to me just feels like it's going to detract a lot from that it's probably going to go with the as you know conclusion that Deckard is a replicant what does that mean how do we explore it also like you wonder after you watch Blade Runner what comes next in this world but that wasn't a question I ever wanted actually answered concretely like I just wanted to imagine it myself there's a lot of I here this is clearly my opinion on it but I'm curious what you guys think about if you're excited for a Blade Runner sequel if you're intrigued by the idea of Blade Runner 2049 or if you're sort of in the same boat as Ahmad and myself where the idea of a sequel to this no matter how quality it may be just makes us feel a little bit, a little uneasy. Off. Yeah, but a little uneasy. I'm, I'm willing to be, I'm willing to have my mind changed on this one. So, well, transitioning from that to new trailers that have come out in the past week, uh, I did not know that Get Out was a movie. It was not on my radar. I've said before, I am a huge coward when it comes to horror. Uh, but I saw Jordan Peele, and I was like, I love Jordan Peele. I love Kim Peele. He's an incredibly talented creator. Oh wow, he made a thriller slash. Horror, horror movie, movie that's not comedy at all, but basically, we were just talking about this, basically a Cam Peel sketch without the comedy in it. Uh, it's coming out in February, again, written directed by Jordan Peel, and it's basically about a, a black young gentleman who travels home for the weekend to meet his white girlfriend's parents, and- uh, For the first time. For the first time, and things get a little nuts. <laughs> yeah, the, the town's a little weird. Uh, I think that's putting it mildly. Yeah. Um, there's there's some weird stuff going on. There is a very strong Stepford Wives meets Guess Who's Coming Home to Dinner vibe. Um, but this one popped out of nowhere almost in the same way that Keanu did, where that trailer went up and people, I remember people coming up to me like, is this real or is this like a <laughs> YouTube skit? Like, no, that is a real movie. Like, they're not just messing with us. Like, no, this is the same thing where it's like, hey, I went, I went to Blumhouse and I writ, wrote and produced and directed this movie and we'll see how it goes. I was very sad when Key and Peele ended and that show, just the skits, like they're so sharp. Those Jordan Peele and Keegan-Michael Key have very sharp minds and it's clear, like whether it's political commentary or cultural commentary or commentary on film and TV and sports, like it's just, it, it really hits it right on the head and for Jordan to take that and bring it to like the thriller horror genre I'm so that trailer looks great I'm so excited to see what he came up with yeah it's it it looks creepy as hell um, <laughs> for for something coming coming out of comedy and for something coming out of out of one of those two it it looks creepy as hell so it's on our radar for February which is you know pretty a decent month, becoming a decent month, definitely. It's good coming out during Black forward. History Month too. <laughs> <laughs> extra, <laughs> extra. It, this one's going to be really interesting. It'll be interesting to see a little more of this movie. And I'm excited to see him be able to say, "Hey, look at all these other amazing things I can do." Uh, we also got a new Pirates trailer for Dead Men Tell No Tales. What noticeably, was missing from <laughs> there? noticeably missing Jim Vavita. Uh, noticeably missing Jim Vavita and Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow. Oh. 
wonder why. He was on a wanted poster, yeah. Do you do you think that it was entirely because of all sort of the, the scandal and this issues is, happening in this personal this life? This is not the time. I, I think they, they have a schedule and they have a release schedule, they have a marketing schedule, things have to happen at certain times. But this is probably not the time to put him front and center and because I mean, then they're going to spend a week responding and having people make comments. And I'm sure they're just like, let's let everybody know there's another Pirates movie. Uh, here's what kind of it looks like. And we'll go from there and we'll proceed with caution. And I will say, I think the, the issues with his personal life aside, the biggest issue I think you have in not having Johnny Depp in this trailer is people thinking that Captain Jack Sparrow is not a part of it. But they do sort of get around that because uh, Javier De Bardem's ghost pirate captain, Captain Salazar, is very much the focus of this movie with Brenton Thwaites. And uh, he's like, where is Captain Jack Sparrow? I have a message for him, blah, blah, blah. So that's me summarizing this teaser trailer. I think that is maybe a good marketing decision, not just, again, related to the personal issues, but also teasing that there is a bigger world out there. And eventually, you can't have Johnny Depp in this franchise anymore one way or another. It makes sense to be able to see if you can sell this movie and sell the excitement, even if you don't have him in it's the It's like X-Men. Eventually, you know, eventually they're going to be like, okay, no Wolverine, no more, less Wolverine, less Wolverine. <laughs> oh, God! Maybe soon. <laughs> or like what's going on with the Marvel movies. At some point, they're going to either have to reboot or relaunch. Or Robert Downey Jr. isn't going to keep coming back as Iron Man, and then what do you do? Yeah, I don't know. He seems like if they turn a camera on, he's like, all right, I'll come. All right. All right. I feel like he's, a, Chris Evans is the one, I don't know how he just transitioned to Marvel, but Chris Evans is the one there who at first seemed like very hesitant. Now he's like, yeah, no, he whatever. I just like signed up. He turned the role like twice. Yeah. I think two or three times before somebody was like, Chris, Chris, take the role. And he did. I mean, the Captain Jack Sparrow part of Johnny Depp's identity, to bring it back to Pirates, is so much like his most positive public persona. He can go to any hospital, children's hospital in the world, probably adult hospital in the world, let's oh. be honest, and like faces will light up and it's the best charity thing he can do and sort of outreach and especially with some of the negative yeah. conversations around him right now. I, I definitely make sense for him to hold on to the Pirates franchise for a while. That being said, I mean, there was for there was a lot of hoopla about him not being in this trailer. I watched it and I was like, this makes sense for a teaser trailer. If he's not in the full, first well, full yeah. length trailer, then we know that there are some well, internal issues. And it's, it's nice for, for films to actually be accurate, especially in trailers. If, if a character is not gonna be in a whole lot of a film, a uh, large percentage of a film that don't put the character in that trailer, like uh, The Force Awakens. You know, people were like, oh, what happened to Luke? And what's going on? I was like, he's not in the trailer because he's not much, very much in the movie. That's, what do you mean? that's what it is. No, no, no. He's, it's going to be a surprise. They don't want to show. He's not going to be in the movie. <laughs> well, I was. Where I hope some you other said films, I told you so to a lot of people after that. <laughs> I just kind of looked at him funny. You know, that's, that's how that went. Uh, now, to transition to a movie, I know you guys have been like really disappointed and clamoring for us to talk more about because we all were so united on our thoughts about it. We all just agreed and loved it so much. Suicide Squad, the extended cut, got, that was a good setup, right? I almost did a different <laughs> one. Uh, got an extended uh, a trailer for its extended cut edition, which uh, has 13 extra minutes of footage as compared to BVS, which had, Batman v Superman, had 30, 30 minutes of footage. So originally, David, Ayer said it would probably be 10 minutes of footage for yeah. Suicide Squad. Uh, it looks like there's a little bit more. The trailer mostly focused on you know, a lot of scenes that we'd already seen sort of in, cut in an interesting way, but it ended with a scene that we knew existed but wasn't in the original movie, which was whatever happened in that sequence with uh, Harley, pre-Harley Quinn uh, and Joker in the car. So yeah. that's like my best summary of it. But yeah, it seems like Dr. that's what we're going to see. Dr. Quinzel chases yes. down the Joker. Uh, they get into a uh, argument and a physical altercation, and somebody, some other things happen. Um, yeah, it's it's. I think we're you know you've got you've got a ton of scenes like we we had a video earlier this year of all of the kind of scenes that you saw in the trailers that didn't make it to the film. I have a feeling that the bulk of that is going to be that. I think I there are so many. I I don't think it's going to be a lot of stuff that we haven't seen. Obviously, what we saw in the trailer. If you know if you're really paying attention to this movie, you saw something that you had either heard about or seen parts of. 
there wasn't anything in there that if you really focus on the movie that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So I think what we'll probably get are longer takes, extended scenes, um, and a lot of that trailer stuff where it was a lot of Joker stuff that was trimmed. Yeah, I have a feeling that it's going to be primarily Harley and Joker stuff that was trimmed from the movie. Uh, I, you know, if it's one way or another, I'm intrigued to find out what that is. I don't think with 13 minutes you can completely reconfigure a movie and it's an extended cut, not a director's cut, yeah. so I don't imagine there's going to be a lot of things moved around. I don't imagine that this is the rumored competing cut uh, that did not end up in theaters. But I won't see the light of that. I, I you know... <laughs> We've talked about Suicide Squad a lot. I think all our opinions of it are pretty clear, but I am intrigued to see what these scenes are and whether they add any interesting context to the movie that uh, well, was not in the theatrical version. With what Leto said about Joker, what do, you, do you think that, what do you think about how much Joker we'll see or not see? I really think that this is gonna be primarily what he was talking about. I think that for the sake of time and clarity, they probably cut out a lot of the Joker stuff. It's ultimately not a Joker movie. I went as far as to say during our, our uh, spoiler cast that I think this movie could have had zero Joker and probably made a little bit more sense. Um, but I have a feeling this is gonna to go the other extreme and be primarily either Joker on his own or Joker in Har with Harley or maybe just Harley. If, if you're trying to get more people excited about it, obviously the tease they put in that trailer was Harley. She is the thing that people really attach to the most. It yeah. would make the most sense to offer a version with even more Harley, the thing that everyone liked so much. Yeah, and a little bit, maybe a little bit backstory of where the transition was between Dr. Quinzel and full-on Harley Quinn, where yeah. this looks like it's kind of in the middle. Yeah, I found... Now I'm just thinking back to Suicide Squad. We're not going to linger on Suicide Squad too long. We're going to look ahead to new rumors and new rumors that aren't even like the reported news. I'll, the reported news out there is that uh, there are several prominent actresses, uh, Zoe Kravis, Tessa Thompson, and Naomi Scott, uh, who are reportedly auditioning or going through the, the casting cycle for the Han Solo origin movie film. So we see, we see these people and we say, Hmm. Yeah, they, they all have something in common. They're all African-American women. They are. So who from the Star Wars canon is African-American? Can you think of any characters? Santa Staros. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you mean uh, Han Solo's kind of pretend wife? Kind of pretend wife. So if you don't know, uh, and I actually, have you read this comics arc? I, no. We are. We need to like fly Joshua back immediately. I haven't caught up from, after the Dark Horse. <laughs> I was reading the Dark Comic Horse Con. run and I didn't catch up to the Marvel run. But, yet. you know, the Spark Notes version is that um, <laughs> she, Sana said, said that she was married to Han Solo. He contested it. This is all pre-Princess Leia. But uh, basically, they're, they were married or not as part of a scam for a robbery. So it sounds like they do at least have a history, even if they aren't technically married. Yeah. And especially given everything that happened in uh, episode seven, I think people wouldn't begrudge some clarity on where the relationship with the two of them stands. And again, it is canon because it was it's a part, part of, of the, the yeah, series. it was part of the comics. So I, I think that's really cool. I think, you know, bring in, most movies want to have a romantic thread at some point. Yeah. Obviously, we love Han Solo and Princess Leia together. That is the relationship that is really elevated. But you have Sana already in the canon. Why not bring her into the story? And it sounds like she could be a really fun uh, companion to have with Han Solo. They seem like they could be like-minded individuals. Yeah, it, it's we're used to seeing... Um, struggling to be a good guy, Han Solo. It'd be interesting to see full rogue Han Solo and Han Solo when he's, you know, a, you know, playing for cards and winning the Millennium Falcon and all of that. You know, running around playing Sabacc all over the the universe. And so it'd be interesting to see kind of rogue Solo. If if we are right in our theorizing, which of these three actresses would you most like to see take that part? Uh, I, you know what? They're all good, but I'm. I'm going with Tom on this one. Uh, I'm Tom, going with Tom, our Tessa. producer, our man with a plan behind the camera. Tessa I'm Thompson? I'm going with Tessa. Yeah. Uh, what she was, was the role? excellent in Creed. Creed. She's so good in Creed. Um, uh, Zoe, Zoe, I think, has a bunch, uh, tons of roles ahead of her, but I, I think this one might go to Tessa. Yeah, she's sort of, she's the 
queen bee around town. She's been in a bunch of a bunch of big films, so I think that would be really cool. Uh, that basically wraps up our new, new, new stuff to talk about, but I do want to talk about box office. I also want to give everyone a heads up, as we said at the beginning of the show, uh, all our, our cohorts at IGN Entertainment are in New York at New York Comic Con, so there is going to be a bunch of new news that we can't talk about now because it hasn't happened yet, but you should keep an eye on the site because we'll be reporting on it extensively, and you, if you miss Josh Joshua and Scott and Eric's faces, like like we do, then you should and be Jim. able to see it there. Uh, and Jim, well, Jim, Jim, well, you can he's find. Right there, yeah, he's right so. here. He's here with us. He's also not in New York. He's having a blast uh, on yeah. like an Inferno scavenger hunt with Tom Hanks in in Italy. This, this so that is accurate. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's doing pretty well for himself, even though we've uh, burned the place down and have taken over keeping it real. We aren't giving it back. He only gets to be on that photo behind us. Uh, but box office. So it looks like the biggest movie coming out this weekend is The Girl on the Train, which I saw and reviewed and did not particularly care for. I. It's like one of those movies that when you're scrolling through Netflix two years from now and you're like, mm, I just like want something. It, and it's probably going to fall asleep soon. I'll put this on. Or like you have like a free movie offering on a plane. Low investment And movie. you're like, you know what? Sure. Take me on this adventure. Uh, that is what I recommend The Girl on the Train for. I gave it a 5.5. It, it may, I have not read the novel. You said your wife did. Yeah. Uh, and she enjoyed the novel. But it just seemed like if there was something more to the story that was more compelling in the the book that it didn't necessarily make its way to the screen. It it thought very highly of itself, but it it's focus on twists and turns that were ultimately pretty predictable and I think not all that compelling was disappointing. There are a lot of comparisons to Gone Girl, and not just because it has girl in the title, like the girl on the train author thinks. Uh, it's, it's very much twisting the idea of what an ideal marriage, what an ideal woman, uh, what an ideal mother is on its head. But it doesn't really come to any conclusions. The movie ends up feeling pretty hollow. And as much as it has this impeccably talented cast led by Emily Blunt, who does the very best she can, she's the best part about the movie, it just, the characters are, are not well drawn. They end up being unlikable stereotypes, and I just, I did, I did not, <laughs> I did and, not and, particularly and care for it. And it's pretty rare that you can get one. For a movie to really succeed, it's, you you have to have multiple things that succeed. And if if you've only got two or three, you're and no matter how good those two or three elements are, you you're, you're not going to be engaged. You're not going to be entertained. And it sounds like having having a, an engaging star. Trying to hold up everything else is, wasn't enough. And just a couple of keeping it reals ago, which it, were probably a couple months ago, because we have been uh, a little busy and little inconsistent busy. on doing them here. I was even saying that's like one of the movies I'm really excited to see. So I'm disappointed that it can't be an overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive review. But it is looking like it's going to be the number one movie this weekend. Uh, not tracking to be as big as Gone Girl, but probably 26 to 28 million according to Box Office Mojo. It's not um, bad. Following behind it to repeats, Miss. Peregrine is looking to be at number three, which we gave a 7.2, and Deepwater Horizon is looking to be at number three, which we gave a 7.3. But then estimated to come in around the seven or eight million dollar range is The Birth of a Nation, which is finally coming out this weekend. Uh, Have you had a chance to see it? I have not. I realized uh, I missed a screening last week, which I, I have decided I'm very excited to see this movie. I was on the fence a little bit with Nate Parker's personal burners. issues, but I was like, you know what, I really want to see this movie. Uh, John Lasser reviewed it for us and gave it a 9.2. That was the 9.2 I was promising two much nines, earlier. Two one episode. Uh, in this one pos- <laughs> yeah, Two 9.2s even. Uh, yeah, he, he really he really enjoyed it. You can read his review. It's up on the site. Um, it is getting, I think it's at like a 75 or something oh, on Rotten God. Tomatoes right now. Uh, it is getting some mixed feedback, but John really liked it, and uh, Josh, Josh, Josh wow. Lasser. Um, yes, yeah, I'm the, very excited. The feedback seems solid, just, you know, it's one of those things where people have to figure out if they can separate their art from the artist. Uh, people seem to do that with Woody Allen movies all the time, and uh, a couple other people, and Polanski movies. Um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see if the audience runs out there. Yeah, so that'll about do it for us. You can find us on many of our apps, like Roku, which is Jim's favorite of IGN's apps that he likes to bring up. Uh, You can email our email address at keepingitreal.gmail.com. Yes, and uh, we do not have access to it. But Jim will likely get back to it if the Justice League lets him come back. Jim has like a bat decoder thing where he gets all the keeping it real messages. He does. 
So um, hopefully you, enjoy, you enjoyed the C team, not even the B team, because team. because that was you and Joshua on some Game of Thrones. Uh, no, that was Jim and Joshua on Jim some Game Joshua, of Thrones yeah. stuff. Uh, but hopefully you enjoyed the C team. We didn't burn the place down too much. <laughs> no, for, no smoke. No smoke. For all things movies, no smoke. Keep it here at IGN. Laters.